And um, let me now uh, start with my own talk, uh, which is today on water management in ancient India. Last week, for those who were there, we saw ecological traditions in ancient India, and we saw the importance that ancient India gave to nature, to its preservation uh, through various ways, and also the whole philosophy of uh, approaching nature as, as uh, something sacred, as sacred as the whole creation, in fact. So I kept water management and water structures apart because it is a very important topic that deserves special study. So therefore, I will treat it in a somewhat summarized form today. Uh, why is water management so crucial uh, in ancient India? I'm always using the word ancient in a somewhat elastic meaning. Um, it is because, obviously, we are not having a temperate climate in India. Uh, if you go to a country like France or England or, or perhaps Italy, uh, countries with temperate climates, they do not need to do much by way of water management and water structures. Of course, they have uh, uh, imposing water structures, but they are counting on rainfall being more or less round the year, which is what happens in practice. Um, so, though, though of course the climate has been uh, uh, changing, so uh, recently uh, Europe has experienced long droughts, sometimes stretching over two, three years of uh, very lean uh, rainfall. Uh, so they are also uh, uh, coming round to uh, the, the kind of thinking we're going to explore. But in India, this has turned out to be far more critical to the sustainability of agriculture because counting purely on rain-fed crops uh, is a very risky game. And uh, right from the most ancient times, and uh, uh, we will see about Harappan times to start with, um, Indians tried to create various irrigation methods. So to irrigate, you have to manage your water resources very efficiently. And this is what, what we'll see. So let me start uh, with the Indus civilization. As I said, I'm treating it very in a very summary form. In fact, through just two, um, uh, two sites, two settlements. One in Mohan is Mohanjo-Daro, and this photo is from Mohanjo-Daro, and the second will be Dholavira. So in Mohanjo-Daro, you have to keep in mind that this city is on the banks, was, today it is no longer so, the Indus has shifted away, it was on the banks of the Indus, uh, necessarily so because transport is the uh, great advantage of having a river, and transport, uh, um, river-based transport was critical to the Harappan economy. So, uh, Mohanjo Daro was, was right on the bank of it, and the Indus is a river which, as you know, can go into spate, does go into spate. The, the, the expense covered by uh, the, the explosion of the river today is limited by a number of dams upstream uh, in, on the river basin. But in ancient times, of course, there were no dams, and we have records for example, from the chroniclers of Alexander the Great uh, of the Indus going into mighty spates and swallowing hundreds of villages at a time. So how then, what were the, what were the consequences for the Harappans living in Mohenjo-daro? It was, of course, that there was a very high water table, number one, which is still the case today, incidentally, and it is a pose, it, today it is, a po it is posing a problem for the uh, conservation of the site because the high water table uh, creates, uh, I mean, means that all these beautiful baked bricks are, are constantly absorbing uh, dampness coming from the <coughs> uh, uh, underground layers. Uh, but then the second problem that the Indus was posing is that when you have such powerful uh, uh, underground sources, they're going to exert a pressure on any well that you're going to try to build. So I'm pretty sure that the Harappans initially tried to build their wells with bricks of the regular kind, the kinds that they were using to build their houses. And those are, as you might remember from an earlier lecture, the regular standard uh, rectangular bricks. And the Harappans had, in fact, you can see them on the right side of this picture. 
you can see right uh, on the extreme right, out of a wall where the bricks are quite clearly rectangular. And the, as I mentioned earlier, the Harappans invented the, the brick where, which has a length twice the width and a width twice the height, which permits very compact walls where you have alternating uh, uh, lengthwise and widthwise uh, uh, bricks. Now it sounds perfectly obvious to us, but it wasn't obvious at all in, in those days. And it is, not, uh, it is uh, uh, so uh, uh, little obvious that in the Ganges, following Ganges civilization, this will be forgotten. And Gangetic civilization, if you visit any of the sites, you will see that the bricks are not as per those modern proportions. They are usually flattish, squarish, and uh, therefore the walls have to be so much thicker. Anyway, but for the, for, the, for the well, if you're going to use these bricks, what's going to happen is that with the tremendous underground pressure of the, uh, uh, of the seepage of water into your well, those rectangular bricks would be displaced and they would slip in and eventually your whole structure will be weakened and will collapse. 2,000 years later, under the Roman Empire, the Romans were great hydrologists. They constructed lots of fantastic water structures, but they could never deal with this problem. And they were using the, the wells they were building were square wells built with stones. We also have them in India, in South India in particular, lots of you can see lots of such wells, but then you see this is vulnerable to such uh, underground uh, pressure and they had to deal with well collapse constantly and well they would rebuild their wells, this is what basically they did. The Harappans 2000 years earlier had solved the problem by creating those trapezoid or wedge shaped bricks which you can see here, these are not rectangular, they have an angle and this means basically, now you can picture the whole thing easily, that when the pressure builds up, it all locks together. This is nothing but the principle of the arch, you know, vertical arch. Now, the Harappans did not ever have the brain wave of turning it vertically. So they had only the horizontal arch, if I may call it so. But it is just as effective. And the result is that those wells, this has been proved by extensive uh, uh, excavations at Mohenjo-daro were in existence for five, six, sometimes seven hundred years uh, without any, any, you know, without being affected by those uh, uh, collapses. So this is quite a remarkable <coughs> achievement which shows again that the Hanapans were people who were, you know, able to, uh, we, we're not trying ever to, sh to say that their cities were more advanced than ours today, that would be a ridiculous statement. But certainly, they were able to cope with their local problems in a very effective manner. That is certainly to their credit. So, <clears throat> as I said, I will not deal with the entire picture in the Indus civilization. I will just jump to Dholavira, contemporary with Mohanjodaro, located in the Ran of Kutch, which I briefly introduced in uh, what was probably my very first talk in this series. And uh, Dhoravira has this particularity of being in a very, very arid environment, unlike Mohanjo-daro. So the problems are going to be totally different, which is why I have taken those two extremes. And uh, this is uh, on an island in the run of Kutch. There is some evidence that the climate was a little more congenial, a little wetter, but not much more. In fact, I'm going to show you how the architecture tells us that the climate was not, was not very lush. It was still quite an arid climate. So they wanted, the Harappans wanted to establish a city, a big city, in this uh, uh, very arid location for reasons which have to do very briefly with control of the raw materials that they were extracting from Gujarat. They needed a lot of, uh, in particular, semi-precious stones uh, and other mineral products uh, from Gujarat, which they didn't have in Sindh. And uh, for that reason, it, I mean, this is a consensus among archaeologists that they established this as a kind of gateway into Gujarat to, uh, to control the, the movement of goods. And also, we know for sure that the run of Kutch, which uh, today is at best a marshy expanse during the monsoon, 
and then a white and dry expense for the rest of the year was actually navigable uh, in Harappan times. Uh, so Dholavira, so this island on the run of Kutch was really an island in the sea, in an arm, in a shallow arm of the sea. And they were using this as a, as a means of quicker transport, of course. So, but the question was, to establish a city in such a remote location and make it sustainable for, well, centuries together, how do you manage the, 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 the water problem? Because you cannot, as you might be doing today, you cannot bring a pipeline from the Narmada 200 kilometers away. So you have to manage with local resources, and that was the challenge. So this is a plan of Dolavira, where uh, I remind you, you have the upper city here in blue, divided into two zones. This is the heavily fortified area of the so-called castle. Uh, a little lower, you have the middle town in pink with the huge ceremonial ground, and then the lower town uh, uh, in, in yellow. And um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this, this is where most of the uh, houses, inhabitants lived, you, uh, with a uh, little extension in this area of the lower town. But we can see that this location was very intelligently selected by the Harappan civil engineers, if I may use that term, but I think they would deserve it, because it is bracketed by two streams, two nallas, <coughs> small streams, uh, which you can see them today, they are 10, 15 meters wide, and today you will hardly ever see a drop of water unless perhaps you visit uh, during the brief monsoon. Run of Kutch today has a very brief monsoon. So the question was how to make use of that water which flows <coughs> during the periods where there is rainfall. And what they did was that they dammed those um, streams, several relics of dams, I'm going to show you one, have been found. They dammed those streams and they forced the waters to flow into the city, into the fortified area. And <clears throat> all this sector in particular, if you can follow my red dot, all this sector was kept entirely for water harvesting. Plus a number of reservoirs which I'm going to show you in addition. But this is, this is the way they found that they, they, they obliged the water to flow into the city. Whether they were ab able to uh, you know, uh, quickly build up a structure to close the water after the rains, uh, we don't know. They, we, we, we lack the full evidence of the system. But they covered something like 12 hectares out of 48 hectares. 12 hectares, perhaps. The, the, the proportion is not very sure. It is anything between 15 and 20, 25% of the area, which was earmarked entirely for water harvesting, water storage. So this is, of course, water storage on, on a huge scale. <clears throat> this is a view of, uh, it's a video grab, so please excuse the low quality. But this is a, a view of the existing Nala um, uh, on one of the two uh, uh, the existing uh, uh, stream which bracketed the city. This is on the southern side. And this is a conjectural structure, wooden structure, palisade, which might have been used to strengthen uh, the, the stone dams. It is possible, but it may also have been that they just used massive stones and didn't need those uh, reinforcements. That we do not. And this is a computer reconstruction of what the city might have looked like. Again, the two streams are here. This is the south uh, east corner and northwest here. And this is what perhaps the city would have looked like after the, at the end. Minutes. So in which is the, this fortified area where the rulers obviously lived. We, in the Harappan cities, you never know, uh, you, know any, you, ne you can never tell that there is any particular palace or any grand uh, habitation where you can picture a king living. There, there's nothing like that anywhere. The habitations apparently were just like any others. But they distinguished the location always by having those upper cities, upper uh, areas 
uh, the, the, the Acrop what I've called the Acropolis, and uh, they would uh, 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 certainly have lived in those apartments. So here in Nassau, it is rich in water structures such as these tanks. And these tanks receive the waters not from the, the two streams I have shown you, it's much higher, but from additional water harvesting conducted within the city itself. They didn't want a drop of water, rainfall falling on the castle, on the ramparts, on whatever uh, houses were there to be wasted. So there are, there are complex systems of tanks like these uh, which are actually interconnected. I don't know if you can see this opening here. There's another here. And uh, these are actually uh, underground drainages which will harvest water from various parts of the castle and take it to these uh, tanks. And of course, this staircase is designed simply because as you draw water, the level is going to go down and you need to be able to access uh, further down. Uh, some of those underground uh, stormwater drains are huge. You can see here the, this lady worker giving you the scale. This is about six feet in height. You can see the massiveness of the construction. And this gives us a message that uh, probably, you know, uh, the, some rainfalls were very intense. There must have been some occasional torrential rains possibly also once or twice in winter. So for that, even though for the rest of the year it might not rain at all, they could not afford to take an average. They had to calculate all the structures and, uh, and tailor it to the maximum rainfall that could occur so that they would not waste it. You see, they cannot afford to have medium structures because they have low rainfall on an average basis. That's not how it works, obviously. So, and this is Dr. Bisht here when we, we visited the site with him some uh, five years ago, uh, Dr. Bisht uh, uh, excavated the um, uh, whole site of Dolavira for 14 excavation seasons. So very massive underground uh, structures and then additional reservoirs uh, with regard to the, the series I showed you uh, on the computer reconstruction. Uh, reservoirs which were receiving waters probably from those streams, but possibly also from uh, harvested water at various parts of the city. So this one is the most massive of all. It measures 73 meters in length. And you can see this is the, the, the castle here. Um, it is located on the eastern side of it. It's supposed to be 10 meters, but actually the, 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 the full depth was never reached. Excavators had to stop at a certain point, uh, so it could be deeper, and uh, the, the, the width is 29 meters. So at the bare minimum, if it was ever full, which we cannot say for sure, it would have uh, uh, contained 20,000 cubic meters of water, quite huge. Um, it has two stairways, you can see here, which obviously are designed to uh, allow people to go further down to the water level as it recedes. And in addition, there is here a, another very interesting structure, which is a stepped well. Initially, there was a, incidentally, there was a wrong news item in the Times of India not long ago that IIT Gandhinagar had just discovered it. This was a story made up by the reporter. There was nothing like that. It was discovered during the excavations around 1995. Anyway. So this temple is very interesting because this is a well, but then this is a tank. So how does it work? Obviously, when your tank fills up during the monsoon, the, this, will, this is going to recharge the water table through the well. Then the well acts actually as a receptor. And when your tank eventually uh, empties in the course of the year, then you still have the well as a kind of extended storage, and you can start drawing water from it. This would be the explanation if the well is contemporary with the tank, but there is a question mark, and there is a possibility that it is actually later structures, structure. And these questions are always a little delicate to answer for sure. So I'm giving you the two possibilities. Uh, this is another magnificent uh, a reservoir on the southern side of the castle. Castle is just here. You can see the, the edge of the rampart here. 
And uh, this is 33 meters. I was going to say only 33 meters, but that's colossal enough uh, in length. And for some reason, the Harappans dug a secondary uh, 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 reservoir within the first. It's all rock cut. It is, it is, you know, cut in the sheer rock. And though the stone is not extremely hard, nevertheless, it would have meant probably hundreds of workers engaged for months and months and months. We can kind of calculate and come to a rough estimate. So this means obviously control over huge manpower. And there's an economic factor here that is only a pro certain prosperous uh, society that can afford to construct such structures. Uh, so this is the southern reservoir. And it is interconnected with other reservoirs uh, upstream of this one through huge uh, underground passages like this. So the obvious purpose behind these um, underground drains connecting all the reservoirs together is that if for any reason one reservoir is going to receive excess water, it's going to be able to pass it on to others. So you can see how the whole thing is very intelligently designed. And well, the only uh, conclusion we can say is that we know for sure that the city was sustained for at least 600 years, if not 700. So, so therefore, they were able to manage uh, this water problem, which, uh, well, today would, be, today would be very difficult to do. So in fact, there are no cities today on this uh, island in the run of Kutch, and uh, not even towns, not even any big villages. You have only small villages and hamlets. That's all you have today left. So it certainly goes to the credit of the Harappans that they were able to solve these uh, uh, local problems. There is a very interesting other structure contemporary with the uh, Harappans at its oldest uh, stage. But then this is a type of structure called the Gavarband, which will continue for many centuries and in fact millennia. Uh, this is found in Balochistan. Uh, it is not the work of the Indus civilization. These were, when it was first constructed, these were uh, uh, local people who were not, strictly speaking, part of the Indus civilization, but they were on the periphery of it. And uh, this is an interesting um, uh, structure which is simply built on the edge of a stream. And the idea is to have, a, to construct actually an artificial field more or less horizontal, and therefore, you need, if you're going to have a slope, you need to, to, to uh, structure it uh, vertically. But then it will have an input here, which will allow the stream water to flow in in a, in a gentle way, not, not with too much speed. Now, why should you do that? Well, because that will allow you to have irrigated fields uh, on the, both sides of the, the river or the stream, and not only irrigated but fertilized, because those streams, of course, are, carry, are carrying sediments. So uh, basically, once you have built this, you can you know, sit back and uh, simply uh, take care of your crops, but you don't have to worry about irrigation or fertilization. So this is a very efficient, of course, small scale uh, water management system. But um, uh, as an irrigation device, it's quite interesting. And possibly it could be repeated uh, if we thought along such terms. There, there is some potential here uh, to draw inspiration from it. I jump now into the historical time. So we are now into the Ganges civilization, uh, uh, about 2,000 years after the Harappans. And we see that there is a great concern, even though Ganges is a very, the Ganges Valley is flush with water, uh, especially if you imagine 2,000 years ago, what it, or 2,500 years, uh, it would have been very rich with water, not only the Ganges, but all the tributaries. And nevertheless, there's a great concentration on saving water, not wasting it, using it intelligently, and creating a whole variety of water structures and water devices for irrigation in particular. So this is best exemplified in the Arthashastra, which possibly dates to the 4th century BC, when there are some disputes, as always, about the exact date. doesn't matter. Uh, it is 
contemporary with the Mauryan Empire, <coughs> at least, we know that for sure. And uh, uh, there are mentions of water divining. I'll come back to water divining a little later. Uh, water lifting devices, so this is something that we don't know whether the Harappans had any <coughs> water lifting devices except perhaps the very crude, simple uh, you know, device of having a pouch of leather pulled by a pair of bullocks out of a well, which uh, probably all ancient cultures had. But uh, here there are some slightly more sophisticated uh, structures being described and irrigation techniques. Now, the very interesting thing is that farmers had to pay for water. Water was not regarded as something that was supposed to be free. You know, today in India, water is free. You can dig a bore well in your garden and pump out as much as you like, and nobody can object. There's no law to regulate uh, water use. And the result is that, unfortunately, in many parts of the country, farming has been a huge usually wasteful of water resources, especially in the states when, in addition, power has been given free to the farmers. It's the case in uh, our Tamil Nadu. Uh, I'm sure there are other states in India. And, you know, when you have free water, free electricity, so what is it that restricts you from wasting it? So uh, you can see often farmers overusing uh, water quite shamefully. and. And uh, there's no incentive for them to take, you know, to pay any attention to this resource. So, except that at a certain point, the water table, of course, st starts uh, going down se seriously, and then wells dry up. But even then, it doesn't. My observation in Tamil Nadu is that even wells drying up doesn't even, uh, you know, um, uh, make people think, and you know, uh, encourage them to be more careful about water use. Somehow, that's not what works. So uh, perhaps this is something that people in Kautilya's time had realized. And farmers had to pay a certain amount of tax uh, in kind, that is to say, a percentage of the crop, which could be very high if uh, uh, I think it was up to one third of the harvest if the water structures they were using had been constructed by the state. When the water structures had been supplied by themselves or by the local communities, then the tax amount was much lower. So Kotila goes extensively through all this. And um, you can see some of the actual quotations here. And uh, so this means that there was a great amount of thinking and planning at the state level. Tanks were built for common use by pooling resources from local inhabitants. That is to say, even if the state ordered, wanted, a, if the king, for example, wanted a tank to be built, he didn't send workers from outside. He would simply uh, 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 ask the local communities to do it. And this was actually compul a compulsion on the local communities. Anybody, Cordelia mentions that anybody refusing to take part in the construction of a water structure or an irrigation system would be fine. So uh, this was uh, therefore deeply rooted in the, in the culture. Tax exemptions of varying durations were granted for new or renovated tanks. So I mean, the, the system is very elaborate. I'm only giving a few um, glimpses. Fines were prescribed for obstructing or diverting a water course, failing, as I said just now, to cooperate in the building of an irrigation tank, damaging embankments, or causing a lower tank to dry up by constructing a tank on a higher level. So even if you had a tank on a higher level, a new tank, you had to ensure that structures downstream would not be affected. You know, that, uh, so you can see that th there's a lot of thought given to the whole working. Inscriptions but agree astonishingly with Cortilia. You know, sometimes you have a text like Cortilia, you're not always sure how exactly historically it is. It may or may not be, it depends on the case. But for more secure uh, historical evidence, you often have to turn to inscriptions. And the inscriptions actually confirm very much the kind of uh, practices that Cortilia describes. So lots of different types of tanks, uh, ponds, 
uh, descriptions of their maintenance. Very often, a king or a queen uh, proudly says that you know uh, it has granted this tank or built this tank for this village and so on. Um, <clears throat> the question of desilting comes in the inscription. That is to say, you, you're aware that these structures do require maintenance, repair of embankments, especially after monsoons, sluices, uh, how to you know, block the, the outflow of a tank or the inflow, as the case may be, irrigation channels to take these waters uh, away to the fields that need them, um, irrigation with well water, because thanks to water lifting uh, devices. Then some inscriptions mention that water diviners have to pay taxes. You know, they, uh, they, they, they were giving a service to the community, but they were also paid. Uh, they were earning their livelihood very well for divining wells, and uh, therefore they had to pay taxes. Were, it was not a tax-free job as it is today. Uh, I, if I may take an inscription from a village very close to where we live, near on the outskirts of Coimbatore, Peru, uh, there is a king, a Chola king, who issues orders regarding water management on a, the, what used to be a perennial river flowing south of Coimbatore. Now it's not perennial anymore. It is seasonal. And uh, uh, there is a new dam being built. And the king orders that it must not affect an older one, which should be allowed to fill first. This is a direct echo of what we saw by, by Cotillia. It's very interesting. And this is from the 13th century. Uh, the new dam was designed to store water in times of excess, so as a supplementary device, but it should not affect the existing devices. Um, I, I take this uh, very interesting inscription also from Andhra Pradesh, uh, 16th century, which simply is to, to show the importance given to uh, you know, building tanks and tanks and tanks. So it says even gods, men, ancestors, celestial beings, reptiles, immovables. Immovables means trees, plants, what doesn't move. Demons and spirits depend on the water of the reservoirs, and the water impounded in such works will quench the thirst of the animals, birds, human beings, and others. As a result, those who construct such reservoirs will earn the punya of performing the Ashwamedha sacrifice. Ashwamedha was regarded as you know, the, the sacrifice that would bring uh, uh, the, the highest uh, degree of punya. So if you take care of tanks and reservoirs, it's as good. And so it is actually last year, a week, I think I had shown a similar uh, statement made in, uh, I think, Shiva Purana. So uh, there is, so this is uh, uh, quite established in the popular culture. Therefore, now let us look at a few actual structures. Uh, one is actually I'm selecting it because it's very close to uh, Kampu. It's about I think 150 kilometers from here, close to Allahabad, in fact, and it is Shringvirpur, a small, um, today a small village but what apparently might have been a much larger settlement uh, about 2,500 years ago. Why was it excavated? Because Sharingavirapura, if you pronounce it in the Sanskritic way, uh, is the place in the Ramayana where Rama, Lakshmana, and Sita cross the Ganges when they begin their exile, when they uh, travel out of Ayodhya. So you, you might remember the whole story uh, of the crossing of the Ganges. I'm not going to tell it. But in any case, it was ex uh, excavated by Professor Bibi Lal in uh, the 1970s uh, uh, as part of a project of excavating sites associated with the Ramayana to identify what structures actually existed there. Now, whatever this may be, the point is that uh, a whole series of huge tanks and reservoirs was found interconnected. Uh, that's interesting because uh, we saw interconnected tanks at Dhulavira. So whether there's a continuity there or not, we cannot say for sure. You have the Ganges here, but uh, after a discussion with Professor Komudi Patil, I learned that Ganges was actually one and a half kilometers away at the time when the tanks were built. So it, it makes more sense. Uh, there must have been a canal like this one bringing in water from the Ganges, especially when the Ganges would go into spate. 
which again in those in, in that period must have been you know very massive spate uh, flooding possibly a few kilometers on, on both sides. And what you find here is that you have one, two, three, four tanks with carefully adjusted inflow and overflow levels. Uh, for example, here the first tank, the outflow is at a higher level than the inflow. Why should it be so? Because then it will cause the water to slow down. And only when it reaches a certain level, it will flow, overflow into the second tank. So when water flows, its sediments, what it carries, tends to drop. So it's a settling pond, basically. And this must have been to you know, give initial purification of, of the water. And then it goes on. And there are wells also at the bottom of some of the tanks. And uh, the last overflow level is so adjusted that if, this, uh, uh, if the whole system is full, the excess water will flow back into the Ganges. So in other words, no wastage. And uh, this, of course, will be due, thanks only due to the pressure of the, of the, of the flow into the canal and uh, the Ganges itself. And a uh, very intelligent system, which I think we could still very well learn from today. But such systems are not uh, being used, to my knowledge, anywhere in India. And uh, this must have uh, supplied water to, to the local settlement, especially if the Ganges was one and a half kilometers away for centuries together. This is a completely different water structure. Uh, this is the Grand Anikat <coughs> on the Kaveri water downstream of the Sri Rangam uh, island in Tamil Nadu, where this huge structure, which uh, uh, um, uh, looks uh, uh, new, was, is actually uh, 1,800 years old or so. Uh, not the upper part of it. This is recently no renovated, but the lower part and the foundations. It is supposed to have been built by the Tamil king uh, Harikala. And, um, and this uh, Harikala Chola. And the, the structure is about 300 20 meters long, what you saw on, in the previous photo. Now, what's very interesting here is that it's often called a dam, but it is not a dam at all. It doesn't stop the flow of the recovery, doesn't impound the waters. Rather, it is here to keep those two streams of the recovery apart, and so that they don't mix together. Otherwise, what would be happening is that this stream is actually faster. The slope is higher. And if there is no structure here, this, this is going to be completely <coughs> captured into it, which probably was the case originally of the river. And with this so-called dam, the stream is now kept apart, and it can go and irrigate uh, thousands, tens of thousands, actually, of acres uh, further downstream. So this must have been a structure built precisely for the development of agriculture in this whole region, which will form part of the delta of the Kaveri. Uh, this has been uh, studied by uh, some uh, uh, researchers uh, from IIT Delhi. But the, it is only a preliminary study. In fact, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole structure is not still fully understood, and in particular, uh, the British, who tried right from 1777 to document and understand and restore the structure through complex systems of, of sluices and gates, they could never really grasp the whole purpose of it. So, and in particular, its S shape uh, has given rise to interesting speculations, which I won't go into. You will have to read those papers if you wish. But um, uh, we've not really fully understood it. So it's interesting to see how uh, uh, advanced those ancient structures were at times. This is from Burhampur in Madhya Pradesh. And we are now in the Mughal time, where uh, the Mughals were also very good at uh, building very complex and integrated water management systems. Uh, integrated here because the nearby hills are used uh, to capture a lot of groundwater. So hills are always wonderful natural water harvesting 
systems to capture the groundwater. So this is captured into a series of uh, 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 structures like this one and then allowed to flow through an underground tunnel which has been dug therefore and because you will have differences you will have pressure accumulating you need air vents uh, to, to make sure that the flow is not disturbed and finally it comes out uh, in an open tank here so uh, this is uh, the, the system in brief but uh, in addition the air shafts can also be used as to, to draw water directly from them if you wish uh, this is an example of horizontally dug tunnel so it represents again a huge amount of uh, work and uh, manpower and uh, these are some of the vents in the uh, at Burampur uh, which you can see but uh, people now are using them exclusively as, as wells and uh, the, the whole system has decayed because uh, it is no longer maintained. You see those systems mean that the, the, the silting has to be taken care of uh, you have to make sure that uh, there is enough tree cover uh, to provide sufficient groundwater. Uh, the hills have been denuded. Uh, so finally, you know, though all these systems fall into disuse and you may have a little water left which the villagers will uh, uh, draw as if these structures are wells. They are actually not wells, properly speaking. Um, you find them in many parts of India. This is now from Kerala where they are called Surangams and they, they are dug into the hills sometimes to something like 300 meters long and uh, there are specific communities groups of families that take care of this of these works and maintain them but again uh, you know families nowadays break apart and uh, some many of these structures have fallen into disuse so uh, but because it, it would take normally a generation or two to, to dig such a, a structure uh, when uh, you don't have you know, a king uh, managing an army of workers. This now we, we shift to Rajasthan and we see a few structures there. For, some of them are extremely simple. This is called a Kadin. It's basically a check dam where you can you take advantage of a catchment area which, with a slope and impound the water and uh, uh, this will actually uh, uh, feed uh, from underground, feed a well from which you can draw. So these are very efficient, small scale water harvesting structures. Then you have the question of the uh, water harvesting in the famous Rajasthan forts. And uh, this is from, for example, Chito, which saw many battles, including uh, very fierce battles with the young Akbar, uh, when he, uh, before he became Akbar the Great. Uh, this was the scene of a very bloody uh, war. And uh, the, the, the thing, of course, is that besieged forts anywhere in India are vulnerable not only on account of uh, 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 lack of, uh, I mean, uh, depletion of food reserves, but also water reserves, even more critically. So very elaborate water structures have been devised to, again, harvest every drop of rainfall, but sometime also tap underground reserves. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a team here uh, 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 of uh, uh, people who are researching the uh, Kalinjar uh, fort about uh, 200 kilometers away, I believe, uh, which also has a very elaborate water system. I believe their study is uh, more or less beginning so let, let us hope one day we can have a fully integrated study of one of these uh, very interesting uh, water management systems. This is another city, Jodhpur, which, where again groundwater flowing from the mountain is being harvested into a series of uh, structures more or less like we saw before at Burampur. But uh, here this, you can see that when you enter the city uh, you find these wells actually um, uh, using the seepage from the water impounded uh, uh, uphill. So these are very intelligent systems, but in Jodhpur in particular, it's not limited to that. Uh, the, the beauty of the system, and, uh, which was, which reached its pinnacle under 
uh, Maharaja Jaswan Singh the second in the 19th century was that it made use of series of uh, uh, lakes and interconnected lakes, um, bandes, canals, etc. So the, the whole system is thought here on a very large scale. It is no longer a small scale device. So this goes very much to the credit of this Maharaja or uh, his engineers, uh, as you prefer. In Bangor, Bangor is a different case because it is very lush with water. And here, the, the main emphasis is going to manage water for agricultural purposes. Uh, the technique here is to allow water to break through the embankment and go into the field. And um, uh, th this breach is very useful in particular when you have a shallow river. When you have a, a deep or massive river, it's not going to work so well because then the, the, uh, the, the breach will simply keep widening. And as before, since these rivers are carrying a lot of silt, uh, this will provide not only irrigation, but uh, fertilization at the same time. This is a view of a device in Gujarat, which uh, uh, we visited some years ago. This is at Patan, which is famous for its uh, stepped well. Uh, but uh, in addition, nearby, there is this uh, series of uh, uh, tanks uh, which tap water coming from a river called Saraswati, in fact, uh, behind this bande. And the, the, there is a breach here, which during the rainy season will bring in water. This is actually a settling pond again, because so it's an echo of what we saw at Chiringvirapu. You can see how the concepts have traveled, or, or at least have been shared in one way or the other. Uh, the outlet is higher than the inlet, as in the first tank we saw at Chiringvirapu. So this will, this will force the water to slow and settle uh, whatever you know, sediments. And then it will flow into this canal, which will take water to various uh, <coughs> other canals and ultimately fields. Uh, to remember that water is regarded as a sacred resource. And uh, it is, you know, we, we think these are, today we would call these secular activities. But as I made this point repeatedly, in ancient India, there is no borderline between secular and uh, sacred. So you have here three shrines to Ganga, Yamuna, Sarasvati, you know, the three great rivers of ancient India, uh, and, but also the three great uh, river goddesses. So uh, this is a reminder that we are in a sacred context. Uh, not far away, there is the famous Modera temple, where you can see uh, a magnificent uh, tank, temple tank. Now these temple tanks, we tend to see them as purely serving religious purposes, you know, for water-based rituals. But actually, they are also water harvesting structures at the same time. They are used very much to recharge the water table. Uh, you can see now that these become works of art with these multiple uh, stairways. And um, the culmination of the step well is probably found in this one in Chan Bauri of Rajasthan, which is supposed to be the deepest in the world. Well, I cannot guarantee that this, is, this information is authentic. But anyway, it's extremely deep. Uh, you have 13 levels, uh, and altogether some 3,500 steps. So uh, this is obviously uh, filling up at different levels in the course of the year. And um, uh, you have to be able to go down uh, and fetch it. Of course, today, nobody would take this much trouble to <laughs> uh, fetch water at such depth. You would use a pump set. Um, in many parts of, the, of India, this concept of a temple tank has spread. And in the south, some of them become really huge, like this one in Shravan Belgola in uh, Karnataka. So once again, they are for religious activities as well as for uh, the mundane purpose of refilling the water table. Uh, this is an interesting structure. Uh, I've not spoken much of dams, but they were dams. Unfortunately, very little, little in no, is known about them. Of course, the basic dam is the earth bundle. 
and that was used throughout and we have seen some examples but stone uh, stone built uh, dams were also in use as in this Anangpur dam near Delhi not far from Delhi this is in Haryana and uh, uh, again studied by uh, professor uh, uh, Srinivas Viravali of IIT Delhi and uh, this is in the 8th century and it actually is used to store rainwater coming from the Aravali hills. Uh, this was, must have been for the city that existed in those days. And um, uh, you see the dimensions of it, quite massive, more than 100 meters in length. And well, it has survived, it is still, it is still in good shape. So if a structure uh, can survive for so long, it means that the engineering is basically, basically quite sound. In uh, the south, we have more studies, uh, again by the same uh, IIT Delhi team here, <coughs> of networks of village ponds, re village reservoirs. Because the reservoir of the village is, of course, the basic unit, and it is, in a way, the the uh, you know the uh, source, main source of water for the village. But then this, uh, what we forget is that in old days, there was always this desire to interconnect such structures through networks of long distance channels, canals. So sometimes, of course, the, the channels could be very short, but sometimes they, they could be much longer. And uh, here, the, the sketch shows simply the relative sizes of their tanks, not their actual shapes. They could be in any shape. They are not square. The, the, the ponds here are not square. The squares are only meant to mathematically show you the relative sizes that these uh, ponds occupied. And one little study uh, shows in this particular basin uh, that there were something like 1,500 tanks. So that's uh, a huge number. And it would be the same in, in most other river basins. Connectivity is complex and variation in size is considerable. The 11 largest tanks which you saw, the, the biggest squares which you saw in the previous slide, uh, together <coughs> account for 60% of the entire reserve, entire storage. And uh, the remaining uh, uh, will be uh, uh, 187 tanks for 40 persons. So why do they bother about so many small, small tanks that actually do not add up to much? probably for a more decentralized distribution. This is uh, the, the uh, thinking. And um, it makes a lot of sense, of course, to multiply small resources in an entire region so that there's much less water to be transported. There is a very interesting study, but unfortunately without quantification, made by <laughs> Professor Nagaraju, uh, who is a well-known archaeologist of Karnataka. And um, he once told me about it, so I asked him to send me his paper. And he studied a region of northeast um, Karnataka, not very far from Hyderabad in, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, but it is in Karnataka, which today is very severely degraded. And it's been degraded for centuries. But then he found in the history, in the inscriptions, in the old texts, he found evidence that once upon a time, that region had been extremely prosperous in particular in its agriculture. So he researched and he found that, no, I'm sorry. Uh, he found that uh, there, is, th there was a certain transition of a kingdom. This was a, a Bahmani kingdom uh, uh, in the 14th century, a Muslim kingdom, which uh, changed the whole emphasis of the uh, uh, main occupation of the people from water harvesting and agriculture to, uh, you know, military occupation, supplying people for the army, supplying, paying taxes uh, to build up a huge army. This was the time when, uh, you know, the, the Deccan uh, region was under a lot of warfare. And the main focus of this kingdom was to build up one arm, mighty army and wage war. And it was not agriculture. So as a result, well, there's a whole chain of consequence that uh, Professor Nagaraju uh, details. As a result, the, all these structures became neglected 
and, uh, and they were, as exactly as we saw in Tamil Nadu, they were interconnected uh, uh, tanks over hundreds of kilometers, and the, the abandonment of this whole structure meant that the region uh, you know, uh, fell into uh, very degraded conditions. It was, in fact, almost on the point of desertification. So this is just to show that um, these structures serve their purpose well, and sometimes very humble ones, like <coughs> these networks of bamboos, split bamboos, which you can see if you travel through the northeast, uh, they are very efficient, low cost, maintenance free virtually. You just have to check that they do not get displaced uh, in the course of time through the passage of animals, for instance. And uh, they capture basically mountain springs and take them kilometers away. They can run for typically three, five kilometers. And bamboo is, of course, abundantly available, so it's not a problem. And they're meant sim simply to irrigate fields. So this was how much of the agriculture in the northeast, not of course in the uh, valley of the Brahmaputra, that's a totally different issue, but in the, in the, in the hills uh, was managed. <coughs> the, my concluding uh, point is that um, these structures, as I said, always required maintenance. And in India, the organization, as with most uh, occupations, was community-based. So there were specific communities, and we have evidence of that, for example, uh, from the inscriptions of the Chola kings in the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries AD, uh, where, where there are descriptions of village committees, committees dedicated to irrigation, to the maintenance of irrigation structures, and uh, this is all community-based. So. <coughs> The, the, the main problem which t happened in India is that when the British took over, they did not allow these communities to continue because they wanted to be under full control of the complete administration simply for the purpose of collecting tax. And uh, tax collection becoming their main focus, uh, they said, they told those communities that uh, now all these village communities are disbanded we, our administration will take care of the water structures. And uh, well, it turned out that, as you can easily guess, uh, no administration can actually do that. It's impossible because it has to be a totally decentralized effort. So the administration, British administration being centralized, it never worked. And though they tried many, through many ways, they created the public works department, they even made laws that try to enforce participation, uh, uh, of the communities into the, the maintenance of the water structures, but nothing worked really. And many of them just collapsed. And the, the, what, re, what happened is that uh, some tanks may survive, but they survived as just individual tanks. The, the interconnected network is the first thing that collapsed. And many tanks also eventually filled up and <coughs> failed. So this is the lesson uh, basically we can draw from the past in this case that large irrigation projects can, you know, are more vulnerable because of all the problems we have seen. Plus, ev problems of evaporation today, loss of water in transport, etc. Smaller and decentralized water management has a better chance to succeed, and that is what was practiced uh, in ancient India. Of course, provided the participation of locals is encouraged, because no government can really do that in a decentralized way. Finally, a word on dowsing or water divining. Uh, this is something that uh, you know very orthodox scientists uh, object to because they say there's no scientific basis for it. And in fact, whatever little studies have been done actually uh, have tended to show that uh, there's no, th there's nothing. There's just absolutely no water divining. It's just luck and nothing else. But then these studies are made in laboratories. They're not made in the field. And the only way to know whether water divining is an effective technique uh, is really to go out to the field and measure the rate of success that these people achieve. For example, this water diviner uh, is the one we called to divine our well, more well, in a fairly dry region, uh, hilly region of Coimbatore. And he gave us an excellent bore well. And the person who had recommended us uh, you know, told us that he had uh, divined eight wells for him in different locations and uh, had never failed in one. 
So here you see him using a very original technique. I had shown a small video, I think, three years ago. Uh, I won't have time to show it, or maybe later one day. But uh, here he's using a very original technique where he has this coconut, you see, which when he passes over what he perceives to be uh, a stream with, rich with water, you can see, and his hand is like this, we were, we were there and we filmed it, you can see the coconut suddenly stand up. And then even if he pushes it down, it will spring up again. If he moves away, or if he touches with the, his other hand water held in a pot, then you see the coconut fall, drop. So this is one technique. It is not scientific, but well, we got water in our well. That's all I can say. And um, there are other techniques, which actually this gentleman also used, uh, which is, for example, to use a lemon uh, uh, at the end of a string. And uh, they will be giving a small impulse all the time, but then when they pass over water, what they say, when they say that there is water, you see that the, the lemon suddenly starts spinning out of control, and sometimes so fast that it tears itself, uh, splits itself into two halves, and just uh, uh, is thrown away. So anyway, there are lots of techniques with, of course, the forked, uh, 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 the forked uh, uh, branch. This is the classical uh, technique, which is also used in Europe even today. Uh, there are plenty. Uh, it's endless. I have seen, we have seen water diviners even using a, a twin blade of grass, dry grass, just this long, and still being able to do something with it. Anyway, um, but I just want to mention that this is an ancient tradition in India. Not only Kautilya mentions it, um, uh, and uh, some inscriptions also, but Varahamira in his Brihad Samhita dedicates an entire chapter called Takarkala. This is the word for dowsing in, in Sanskrit. And uh, there are other texts like uh, Krishi Parashara. And there the methods are basically based on identification of certain trees. Specific trees are listed, at least a dozen of them. And the, he says, for example, if you find uh, a Jamun tree, well, you can move so many feet to the east. And uh, then you dig. And if you find uh, earth smelling like iron at a depth of five cubits, or pale white clay, etc., etc. So you have lots of clues, omens. Sometimes the omens uh, uh, and hills, in particular, have a great importance in this chapter. Great importance, repeatedly mentioned as being an indicator of the proximity of water. Uh, astrological considerations sometimes play a part, but these are just you know bits of what we call traditional knowledge systems. They have not been tested. We do not know today whether uh, Varamira's uh, advice uh, you know, is something that you can rely upon or not. But it's interesting to know that this is an ancient practice.